Wow, magic pulpit appears. Like, it's good. Okay. Well, turn in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, where in just a few moments I'm going to read a passage of Scripture that will be the foundation for today's message. That's Matthew 18. Thank you, John, for that warm introduction and for bringing back good memories of our friend Pastor Keith Evans and our church plant that I started in 1989, which has grown to be a flourishing church near Portland, Oregon. Thank you for those memories. This story happened on Labor Day, and it's a true story. It's about two families. Let's call them the Smiths and the Browns. The Smiths and the Browns lived across the street from each other, and they were best friends. The dads were best friends and enjoyed doing things together. The moms were best friends and cared for each other like sisters. And the children in these two families played together more like cousins. In fact, the moms told me one time that during the summer, they never called their kids home for lunch and often not for dinner. They just said, whoever's at whichever house, when the food is ready, pull up a chair and let's eat. These two families were best friends. And as they often did on Labor Day weekend, they planned to spend Labor Day Monday in a cookout together with games and fun and things that families like to do. But that year, on Friday, Mr. Brown bought, brought home a go-kart. Now, I needed some work, and so on Saturday, Mr. Brown and Mr. Smith spent the day tearing the go-kart apart and repairing and reconditioning it, and then on Sunday, they spent the day putting it all back together and getting it running again, and they promised their kids, if you'll give us these two days to get this go-kart ready on Monday, as part of the picnic together, we'll spend some time letting everybody have a turn riding this go-kart, and that's what they did. So on Monday, they had the big cookout, and afterwards they went out in the street in front of their house and uh, fired up that go-kart and started letting the kids take turns. And one kid took it down the street and came back and took it down the street and came back, and, and they just went down the line of the family's kids in both households until finally it got down to the Smith kid. He was about 12. He got in the go-kart, took off down the street, turned it around, came back down the street, turned it around, and started back up the street again and the accelerator lodged full open. And he drove that go-kart at full speed into and underneath a four-wheel drive pickup parked on their street. And the carnage is too gruesome for even a men's conference. When the police and the ambulance and the coroner all left, the Browns went into their house and the Smiths went into theirs and Mr. Smith called me. And he said, Coach Jeff, Coach Jeff, I wasn't their pastor. I was their little league coach which is a whole other sermon for a whole other conference about men going into the community with the gospel. Coach Jeff, he said, aren't you also a pastor? Yes, I am. Can you help us? He told me what happened, and I immediately went to their home that Labor Day Monday afternoon. I spent time with the Smith family, and because of various situations, they wanted to have a memorial service rather quickly on Thursday of that week, and so I agreed to help them plan that. On Tuesday, I went back to the Smith's house and sat down with them and worked on their grief and, their, and worked on the sermon, uh, a service planning, and then I asked the question, have you talked to the Browns? They said, no, we haven't. Well, I knew the Browns as well because I had just that summer coached the Brown kid and the Smith kid on the baseball team together. They said, no, we haven't, we haven't seen them since the accident. All right. So Wednesday, I'm back at the Smith's house, and I'm dealing with them again about the service the following day, and I said, have you talked to the Browns? They said, we haven't heard a word from them since the accident. And I said, you know, let's go. We walked out of the house, across the street, and up on the porch, and I knocked on the door. 
No one answered. Well, I can be rather insistent, so I pounded on that door. And finally, it cracked open just an eye. And I said, it's Coach Jeff from Little League. I'm here with the Smiths. Can we come in? No response. The door closed. We heard murmuring voices. And finally, the door opened. And I stepped into their living room. Now, these were not wealthy people. This was a small home, a modest home, a small living room. I stepped in. And there, huddled on the couch, were the kids under blankets, wife sitting in a chair, food scraps around on the floor. The smell of that room indicated nobody had left that room in three days. I stepped into the room, but before I could say or do anything, Mr. Smith pushed in past me and stepped up to his neighbor and said, We need you. We're not going to make it through this if we don't make it through together. What happened in that street wasn't your fault. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. It just happened. And we're not going to make it if we don't make it through together. And these men fell into each other's arms sobbing. And their wives, one scrambled off the chair and the other one scrambled around me and they grabbed onto their husbands and the four of them stood there sobbing, holding on to each other. And kids started scurrying out of blankets and coming around me off the porch and pretty soon I had a mob of sobbing humanity all holding on to each other in that little living room. And for one time in my life, I had the good sense not to say anything. <laughs> I just stepped back into the shadows. And guys, that moment... I saw the greatest example of forgiveness that I've ever seen in my lifetime. That happened about two decades ago, and I'm standing here to, de to tell you that story this morning, and I will tell you it is still the greatest example of forgiveness that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Two men saying, we will not hold each other responsible for what happened that none of us could have prevented or stopped, and we'll never know fully what, what happened in that street anyway. We're just going to hold on to each other. This morning, I want to talk with you about the power of forgiveness in a man's life. And I want to do that by not just telling you that story, but by now reading you a story that Jesus told about this important issue of forgiveness. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 23, Jesus speaking, he says this, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison, debtor's prison, until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Brothers, this story and this message divides itself very simply into two parts. Here they are. Number one, we need forgiveness. In this story, the king represents God, and the servant who owed this insurmountable debt represents us. The king represents God, the servant represents us. And the depth and weight of our sin that needs forgiven is symbolized by this extravagant 10,000 talent debt that was owed. 
Now let me give you a little translation. A talent was equal to 600 denarii, and a denarii is a day's wages. I did the math, you don't have to. This is 16,000 years of back wages. Now some of you are thinking, how did that get that far out of hand? Now hang on just a second here. Nobody lets anything go that long. All right, now work with me. This story is a parable. It's based on something called hyperbole, which is gross exaggeration to make a point. Now understand this. Jesus actually spoke these words, but this story never happened. Are you tracking with me this morning? Jesus actually spoke these words. But this is a fictional story, a hyperbole, if you will, a gross exaggeration to make a point. Jesus said, this servant owed 16,000 years back wages. That's how deeply in debt he was to the king. And yet what happened? The king called him in and forgave him this debt. This is a symbol, a picture, if you will, of our stature before God. God is holy and we're not. God is right and we're not. Listen, there's a great gap between God and us. Now, if you're a bunch of younger guys, I might have to convince you of this because you might think you still going to make life perfect, you know what I'm saying? But I'm looking around this room in here this morning and there's everybody in this room old enough to know you had not you do not have it going perfect in your life. Not a one of us in this room would say, "Yeah, well, you know me and God, we're always alike on everything. I pretty much have this thing nailed." You know better, don't you? In fact, the reality is most of us know exactly what we really are. We know the thoughts we have. We know the attitudes we hold. We know the actions we've done. We know the secret things that nobody else knows, at least we think. And, that's, and we know that all of that stands before God as a representative of our sin and the, wet and the depth of the weight of all that separates us from Him. We need forgiveness. But here's the good news. Just like this king God has made forgiveness possible for us in Jesus Christ. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. You say, well, you just don't know. Listen, I've been at this a long time. I do know. I do know. The absolute depravity of of humankind, especially the nastiness of men, or sins itself like a stench before God, and I'm fully aware of how evil we can be, and I still stand up here this morning and tell you, God will forgive it all. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've thought, doesn't matter what you've said, God will forgive you. He makes that forgiveness possible in Jesus Christ. And how you access it, the Bible says, is simply by faith in Jesus Christ. Coming to Him and saying, Lord Jesus, I confess my sin, I turn away from it, and I turn to you. I ask you to forgive me, and from this moment forward, I commit to following you. And in that transactional moment, In that transactional moment, God promises to rush toward you and give you uh, forgiveness that can only come through Jesus Christ. Now, I know what modern psychologists and modern worldview people will tell you. Oh, you don't really need to feel guilty about your sin. There's no really shame in what you've done. You just need to hold on to your truth and you reject all this religious teaching about absolute standards and God's righteousness and God's holiness. Well, I'm going to tell you the truth this morning. God is righteous and God is holy and your shame is real and your guilt is real and rather than ignoring it, trying to explain it away or come up with some psychological uh, trick to make it try to evaporate in your life, why don't you just own it this morning? And say, my guilt is real, my shame is real, I know who I am and I know what I've done. And instead of denying all that, just bring it to God and ask Him to forgive you. And I'm telling you on the authority of the Bible as the Word of God, on my testimony of being a Christian for more than 50 years, and on the testimony of dozens of men in this room, we will tell you this morning, if you will come to God and ask Him, He will forgive you every single time. That was pretty fun right there. That was fun. Because that's the easy part of the sermon. First part of the sermon is over. We need forgiveness. That was easy. Buckle up. Second part. We must forgive others. We must forgive others. What happened in the story? Well, this man who'd had this, this incredible experience of forgiveness 
some people owed him some money. Now, this fellow who owed him money owed him 100 denarii. Now, let me translate that for you. That's three months' wages. Three months. Now, let's get real for just a minute. Everybody in this room has probably been behind on your bills at least once in your life. Okay, maybe not. Well, let me tell you what that feels like, all right? Everybody ha- has had a problem every now and then. You, you, you fall behind. You, you, you miss a mortgage payment. You miss a car payment. You miss a rent check. We, we get that. Uh, and, and maybe, maybe, you know, you're out of work. You're, you're having some challenges medically. You had to take care of something with your kids. You fall behind two months, all right? All right, that's, that's more difficult. Sometimes even that third month. But listen, guys, you can recover from being behind three months. You really can. You get a side job, you bear down a little bit, you cut some, you cut some, and finally over a, over a little bit of time, you can recover from three months. This situation was not that bad. He owed a hundred denarii. But the guy who'd been forgiven thousands of years of debt would not forgive the one who owed just a little pittance to him. And word got back to the king. He called him in and said, I forgave you all that debt. And you couldn't turn around and do the same just a little bit for a person who owed you? Well, I'll tell you what. I revoke what I've done for you. And I'm sending you to prison until you pay back everything you owe, which is what? A life sentence. It's a life sentence. See, we don't have debtor's prison anymore, but back in the day, debtor's prison meant you went to prison, and that meant you worked a job every day, and while you worked that job, the money you made went straight to the person you owed it to. You stayed in prison as an employee and earned the money and paid it off until it was all paid off. This was a life sentence. Do you understand that? It would never be paid off. Nobody's going to pay back 16,000 years of back salary on a debtor's prison paycheck. He said... I forgave you, and I expected you to forgive others. And because you refuse, the consequences are going to come back on you in unbelievable ways. Now, brothers, I want to teach you for the rest of this message what it means to forgive others like God has forgiven you. Number one, we forgive people who don't deserve it. We forgive people who don't deserve it. Listen, brothers, I'm not talking about somebody who cut you off in traffic this morning or didn't put enough in the tip jar yesterday where you work. I'm not talking about some insignificant little thing like that. I'm talking about forgiving people who cut you to the core, left you cut and scarred and bleeding. I'm talking about your ex-wife who took your kids and everything you had left you for another man. I'm talking about your business partner who backstabbed you and stole your company, left you having to start over, vulnerable and broken. I'm talking about your uncle who touched you in a way a boy should never, ever be touched. I'm talking about your racist boss who kept you from getting the promotion that you deserve and set your career back a decade. I'm talking about your child who has rejected everything you stand for, turned their back on you and your family and your faith and walked away from you in absolute rebellion. Is it getting real yet? I'm not talking about some frivolous thing like a cutoff in traffic or a failure to put a, dime in a, t- a dollar in a tip jar. I'm not talking about a, frivolous thi- a frivolous thing that you're forgiving. I'm talking about the real pains of life that cut you to the core. Leave you broken and bleeding, scarred over and in pain. Things that damaged your life, affected your future, cut your career, damaged your relationships. I'm talking about people who really wronged you. And the Bible says you have to forgive people like that who do not deserve it. Second, You forgive people who don't deserve it when you forgive like God. And second, you forgive people like God forgives you. Let me give you some idea of what that looks like. First of all, God will forgive you completely. You know, the Bible says God puts our sin as far as the east is from the west. 
when he forgives us. That's a long way. That's infinity. That's forever. God forgives us. He places our sin as far as the east is from the west. That means it's forgiven and forgotten. Now, here's the problem with us. We don't have that capacity to forgive and forget. We, we'd like to, but it's hard. I, I, I had this deal, I had uh, this situation very clearly said to me once. I, I wronged someone when I was a pastor. I, I did something I shouldn't have. And uh, I stood on it for about two, three weeks. Finally, I had to go over to their house and, and apologize to them and ask them for forgiveness. So I went over and I said, uh, you know, I, uh, what I did to you guys was wrong. What I said was wrong and how I handled the situation was wrong. And I've come over here today to tell you that and ask you to forgive me. And I'll never forget what the man said. He looked at me and said, well, it's easy to forgive, but it's not easy to forget. Well, I thought we were missing something here, but I'm not going to argue with him, Okay. Because honestly, it is easy to forgive, but it is hard to forget, isn't it? So we don't have the godlike capacity to separate sin from the east as far as the west and forget it completely. But here's what we can do, guys. Listen, you can remember it forgiven. You can remember it forgiven. So that every time that memory comes back up in your life, you can remember it forgiven. Man, I've had some of these. Uh, On my third birthday, my mother fled for her life, and we escaped a violent alcoholic who was my biological father, and I never saw or heard from him again. And then two years later, my mother remarried a happy drunk, and I grew up the next 12 years of my life in alcoholic chaos. Those men harmed me. They damaged my identity. They They damaged my sense of security. And I came to adulthood wounded because of what those men did to me. But through God's help, I came to forgive them. And now I have clear memories of those experiences, but I remember them what? Forgiven. So that every time they come back up, there's no anger or resentment or hard feelings or holding on to the past. It's no, I remember those things happened, but now I remember them forgiven. So you forgive people who don't deserve it, and you forgive those people completely, meaning that you set aside even the memory of it, and if you can't do that, then you definitely remember it as forgiven. And then, and then, you forgive people lavishly. Lavishly. You know, my wife has a little measuring spoons. She she likes to bake. She got little measuring spoons, and some of those things are a little bitty. She's got one that I think is a quarter teaspoon. I mean, it's just like a touch of something. Just a tiny little bit. Is that how you hand out forgiveness? With a quarter teaspoon? Now I want you to imagine on this stage right here this big vat of forgiveness. I mean, just a ginormous bucket of forgiveness. Bigger than these barrels across the front. Just ginormous bucket of forgiveness. You're going to forgive somebody. So you get your little quarter teaspoon, you dip it in there, and you come over and say, okay, I'm going to forgive you. you get a little t- that's all you get now. Yeah, that's all you get. Just a little touch, because I'm not giving out forgiveness too lavishly, because you're just going to get a little tiny bit. After what you did to me, that's all you get. Just a little touch, that's all you get. Just a quarter teaspoon. Is that how God forgives? No. Let me tell you how God forgives. See this big bat up here on the stage? Everybody got it in their mind? God has a big ladle in both hands. He walks over, he dips down in that bat with that, those ladles, walks up to you and says, you need forgiveness, and he pours it on you until you're super saturated with his forgiveness, totally covered by it. And then, hold on now, God takes a step back and said, might have missed a spot. And he dips down again. He gets two more ladlefuls, and he comes up, and he just pours it on you until you are super saturated with forgiveness. And he takes a look and says, maybe so, maybe not. And he backs up and puts the ladles down, and then God just pushes the entire vat over on you and all of it comes gushing out all over you that's what it means to be forgiven lavishly god in heaven is not standing around with a quarter teaspoon of forgiveness saying a little bit for you 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 no he is gushing through the blood of his son the lord jesus christ gushing forgiveness over the whole world for anyone who'll come to him and ask him for it oh we forgive lavishly So brothers, when we forgive as God forgives, we forgive people who don't deserve it, and we forgive those people lavishly and completely. But I know what some of you guys are thinking. 
You're thinking, now wait a minute. I don't know if I believe all this forgiveness because if you forgive people like you're talking about up there this morning, if you forgive people like that, that means they got away with it. Where's the justice? Where's making things right? Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Forgiving someone, you're confusing that with eliminating consequences in their life. You forgiving someone does not eliminate the consequences that may come to them for what they've done. But listen, your forgiving them eliminates your right to take revenge in the situation. Forgiveness eliminates your right to revenge. It doesn't eliminate the consequences that may come. In fact, forgiveness says, I'm going to trust God and other people to take care of this for, for, for me. I'm going to grant forgiveness, removing my right to revenge from the situation, and trust that God and others will deal with this however it needs to be dealt with in the future. I was preaching on this similar theme one time in a different context. When I finished the sermon, a woman came up and asked to speak with me, and and, uh, she said, could I speak with you? I said, certainly. And she said, so, you want me to forgive my brother? Well, I could tell by the way she said it, where this was headed. She said, so, you want me to forgive my brother? And I said, yes. She said, well, you don't even know what he did. I said, my answer is still yes. I want you to forgive your brother. She said, well, my brother stole $300,000 from our parents. And when I, was, uh, disco- when I discovered this and started the process of working through all the, uh, the financial aspects of what he had done, I eventually turned it over to the authorities. He was arrested, tried, convicted, and he's in prison today. I said, good. She said, but you said forgive him. I said, I did. And then she asked the seminal question. She said, okay then, what does forgiveness look like for my brother? And I said, forgiveness means you go visit him in prison. You don't take away the consequences for what he did. Forgiveness means I give up my right to revenge. I'm not going to hold on to this anymore. I'm going to let it go. And I'm going to grant forgiveness to this person and trust that God and others will bring about whatever consequences in their lives need to be brought about to bring whatever correction needs to be brought about. But that is not my job. Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, but what if he didn't get arrested and go to prison? (laughs) Well, let me tell you about that. Here's what the Bible says. Every knee will bow down and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Nobody gets away with anything. They don't. The real question for you about forgiveness is can you trust God to make things right or do you have to take care of it? Forgiveness says, I'm going to turn loose of this. I'm going to trust God to make it right. And however God and other people want to work through this situation is up to them. I'm going to grant forgiveness and give up my right to revenge in the situation. And when I give up my right to revenge in the situation, I'm going to move forward without being bound by what's happening in this, uh, in, 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 with what happened to me in the past. So you give up your right to revenge. And when you do give up your right to revenge, it does something wonderful for you. It gives up the control the other person has over you. Do you understand when you hold on to unforgiveness, the other person has control of you? Let me tell you how that works. You're driving down the freeway and you're thinking about it. I can't believe what he said to me. I want to say this. If I had a chance, if I could get away with this, I would. If I could tell her off, I would. If I could say this, I would do it. If I could get even this way, I would. Well, where am I? I've missed three exits. Right? They got control of you. You're laying awake at night, three o'clock in the morning, in bed, thinking about it. Boy, if I could just say this, if I could do this, if I could figure out a way to get back at them, I would. If I could hire an attorney, if I could go after them, I could do this, I could do that. And you realize you've been up from three o'clock to five o'clock in the morning thinking about this. They got control of you. You're sitting at your computer trying to get some work done and your mind just wanders off. 
And you're thinking about what? You're thinking about how to get even in the situation, what you'd like to say, what you'd like to do. And you wake up and realize 30, 45 minutes, an hour has gone by and you've mind, your mind has been somewhere else and they have robbed you of your productivity. When you hold on to unforgiveness, the other person has control of you. And when they have control of you, they're controlling your mind, they're controlling your actions, they're controlling your productivity, and listen, for some of you, they're controlling your relationships, because you can't relate in a healthy way to the people around you right now, because somebody in the past has hold of you and how you relate to people in the present. When you are holding on to unforgiveness, you think you're in charge and you're doing something powerful and you're showing people uh, what's right and what's just and what needs to be. That's nothing, of, that, none of that's happening. When you're holding on to unforgiveness, you're letting another person have control of your life. They're controlling your thoughts, your time, your relationships, your productivity, your emotions. They gotcha. And you have the capacity to break that by granting forgiveness in the situation. Which leads me to the last thing. When you forgive others as God forgives you, you forgive people who don't deserve it, you forgive them lavishly, you forgive them uh, uh, completely. And when you forgive others, you give up your right to revenge in the situation, trusting God and others to make things right. And when you do this, you break the control the other person has over you. And then last of all, when you forgive someone like God forgives you, you release all the negative baggage from your life the other person has placed there. And this illustration came home to me, a number, or this truth came home to me a number of years ago on a trip with the seminary. Now, John introduced me a moment ago and said, I'm the president of Gateway Seminary, and one of the things seminaries do is we take people on trips. Uh, now, these trips have two purposes. They're educational and they raise money. Let's just be blunt. So we take people to the Holy Land and we travel them around and we educate them about the Holy Land and we lecture them about the Bible and all that. And then we ask them to support our school and give, us, give to us financially. And people who go on these trips, they, they know that's what they're going for. They're going to be educated. They're going to be asked to give. And so it's just a wonderful thing. And we take one of these trips every few years. And, uh, and one year... Uh, we went, and we had a lot of people who wanted to go, and we wound up taking two busloads of people. Now, I learned on that trip, one bus. That's one of my laws of leadership now, one bus, okay? But on this one, we had two busloads of people. And on this particular trip, we decided to go for 10 days, a little longer, and go into Jordan and Israel. Now, if you've ever made one of these trips, you know that's a problem right there. Because you cannot travel from Jordan into Israel on a bus. It's not possible. They won't allow it. So to cross the border from Jordan into Israel, here's our Israel into Jordan, either way, here's how it works. You pull up, in this case, to the Jordanian border, and you unload your bus, everything on it, and you put it through metal detectors, and then you walk it about 50 yards across a bridge, and then you put it in another set of metal detectors in case you built a bomb on the bridge, I guess. I do not know this thing. You put it through another set of metal detectors on the Israeli side, and then you load everything on an Israeli bus. So we pull up to the Jordanian border, we unload the bus, I get my roller bag, my shoulder bag, and I walk up, I go through the security, I go through the uh, uh, metal detectors, I cross the bridge, I go through the security, I go through the metal detectors, and I put my things on the bus. And I turned around and looked across the bridge, and I saw two busloads of old people standing over there with their luggage. Who goes on these trips? Old people. Why is that? Two reasons. Old people have the time and old people have the money. Okay? And I realized if I intend to get to a hotel anytime today, I got to help these people. So I crossed back over the bridge. Now we're about seven or eight days into a 10 day trip and all these old people have been gathering stuff for their grandkids. And they have suitcases full and boxes full of just nonsensical trash that they're taking home to give to their grandkids. And so I go back across the bridge and I'm loading up. I got three bags. I got two more up here. One balanced on my head. I'm walking across there. I put it through the metal detectors. I take it across the bridge. I put it through the metal detectors. I put it on the bus. I turn around, two sweet little ladies. Thank you, Dr. Orr. I'm like, thank you very much. Get on the bus. I look back over there and there's a whole line of them waiting on me. Now, fortunately, I had a couple of younger guys with me and they were helping. So all three of us are making trips back and forth across this bridge about my fifth trip across that bridge with all that junk for grandkids I am ready to throw baggage off the bridge I'm ready to stop in the middle and say that ain't going home that ain't going home that ain't going home and that definitely ain't going home 
All of it's got to go. And as I stood there on that bridge that day, I thought about the illustration of how much time we spend lugging around stuff that is useless in our lives when we ought to just stop and throw it off the bridge. (laughs) Brothers, listen. When you forgive someone, when you forgive someone, you give up your right to revenge, you break the hold they have over you, and last of all, get this, when you forgive someone, you get rid of all the baggage that's unnecessary in your life. Just stop hauling around other people's garbage, other people's nonsense, other people's issues, things that they've done to you, just throw it off the bridge and be done with it this morning. Let's bow our heads together. I want you to make a bubble around you just for a minute, and I want you to work with me through this exercise of forgiveness. First of all, do you need forgiveness this morning? If you do, a simple prayer like this will suffice. Heavenly Father, I've sinned against you, and I need forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, I'm asking for forgiveness in this moment. And by faith in you, I'm receiving it into my life. Forgive me for what I've done. If you need forgiveness this morning, ask for it. And God will lavish forgiveness on you, wash it over you. He'll respond right now if you'll ask him. And now the second question. Who do you need to forgive this morning? Whoop, didn't take long, did it? That name flashed right into your mind. Your ex-wife, your child, your business partner, former boss, a teacher, a coach, an uncle, Who flashed into your mind immediately? In this moment, would you pray and say, Father, this person, just to call their name to God, this person wronged me. And they hurt me so deeply, I'm still trying to get over it this morning. So in this moment, right here before you, God, I forgive this person. They don't deserve it, but I forgive them. And I don't forgive them a little bit. I forgive them lavishly and completely. And God, I give up my right to revenge in this situation. I turn it over to you. And I'm asking you to break the hold that this person has over me and all the damage they've done in my life this morning, I throw it off the bridge. The baggage is gone. Pray that way this morning. God, I forgive this person. They don't deserve it, but I forgive them lavishly and completely. I forgive them so much that I give up my right to revenge. Break the hold they've had over me. And God, help me to throw off every bit of baggage they put in my life because I've held on to unforgiveness. If you will pray that way this morning, God will give you the grace to forgive them and he will give you healing in your life that comes through the power of forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we're not playing around this morning. We're serious with you and with each other. We have been hurt deeply by people who've wounded us. Give us the strength, the grace, and the insight to know how to forgive. 
And by doing that, liberate us that we can go forward and be men who honor you with our lives. And Father, for the men who are here who are calling out to you for forgiveness, give them a full assurance you're hearing their prayer and answering them this morning. Father, I thank you for this story of forgiveness in the Bible, how much it illustrates how great your forgiveness is toward us, and how weighty the responsibility we have to now forgive others. Work this message into our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.